Okay. So my name is Erin Beagle and I'm the executive director here at Roots to Harvest, which is in Thunder Bay. And um, we're really lucky in Thunder Bay to work in partnership and alongside um, the people from the signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty. Roots to Harvest uh, wants to acknowledge and we hope that wherever you are too, that you're able to just remember what land you're on and where you work and play and grow and have a family and friends. Um, here we want to acknowledge the original custodians of the land we're on and pay respect to the elders, the past and the present. They hold the memories, the traditions and the cultures that we're so fortunate to learn from here. I also want to recognize that Rooster Harvest thrives, grows, works and plays on the traditional territory and land of the Fort William First Nation, which is a signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. We acknowledge the, rep the political representatives of the Indigenous nations in Northern Ontario, and we feel responsible for maintaining it in the best way we know how, with our friends and our brothers and sisters. So thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about Roots to Harvest, and I hope that there's a bunch of you on there because it would be great um, to just get to learn more about where people are. Roots to Harvest is a not-for-profit and charitable organization in Thunder Bay. We use food as a tool to work meaningfully with people through employment and education and outreach. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. You can look us up. I'll put on some more information. We are recording this meeting. And um, when you have a chance, please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself, where you're from, where, what organization you're with, or just where you are at as a human. And we'd love to see that. I'm gonna introduce Charles Levko, uh, who will moderate the panel and he'll then introduce the panelists that we feel really lucky to have with us here today. And um, when and if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I would suggest if you really wanna make sure that I see them, that you message me personally, individually at Aaron Beagle. You can put them in the everyone post too. I'll pick up on them. I'll be monitoring the chat the whole time. So either way you wanna do that, if when it's time for questions, you want to, to ask your question out loud, message me directly to let me know you want to do that. And then I'll let you know and I'll unmute you. So that's how I thought we'd do that. I see some of these great introductions coming in. So thanks everybody. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Charles Lepko. <laughs> thanks, Aaron. Um, it's amazing watching, I'm doing, I'm letting people in as you were talking, some of these names, I haven't seen some of these people in so long. Man, Arzina, my gosh, there's all these great people. What a, the nice thing about this COVID thing is, I mean, there's not a lot of nice things, but it's allowed some of us to connect in really interesting ways. So uh, anyways, it's, uh, yeah, it's really, it's great to see everyone here and there, people are just joining all over the place. So uh, I'll just get to it, and uh, we have a we have a whole a whole roster of folks to hear from today. Um, I'll start just by introducing myself again. My name is Charles Levko. I'm the Canada Research Chair in Sustainable Food Systems and Associate Professor uh, in Health Department of Health Sciences here at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. Um, the plan for today, what we had talked about, is I was just I'm just going to make a few. I want to make a few introductory and contextual comments to to get this started. And, uh, and then I'm gonna introduce the panel and we're gonna kind of give each of them about 10 minutes, I think we agreed about 10 minutes each uh, to, to say a few words. Um, and then after that, um, we're hoping to open it up. Uh, and as Aaron said, please uh, feel free to put some questions into the, into the chat box and Aaron will try to keep track of them and I will as well. And then um, after we've all said a few words, we can, we can come back, uh, come, we can come, come to the discussion. Um, so, let me start by saying we're, we're here to talk about the topic of uh, food from food access to equity, reimagining emergency food programs beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was, I wanted to start by setting, as I said, a bit of context for this conversation. Um, and I want to do that by starting with some facts some things that we know. And what we know is that household food security so with, when we talk about food security insecurity, we're talking about inadequate or insecure access to food, which we know is a serious public health problem across this country. Now, while Canada is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, 
well over 4.4 million people. That's more than one in eight people in this country, including over 1.2 million children live in food insecure households. We also know that this is a result of poverty and inequity and that food insecurity is closely related to all kinds of other markers of social and economic uh, inequality or inequity. So it's most prevalent among households with low income, uh, lone parent families, those who rent rather than own their homes. And we know that by the time people have, don't have enough food, they often can't afford to pay their rent or their mortgage, or their medication and a whole range of other, other issues that people face. And we also know that this is getting worse. It is not getting better. And especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. So in May 2020, Statistics Canada polled Canadians about their levels of food insecurity during the previous 30, 30 days and found that almost 15% were food insecure. And that's a 39% increase <clears throat> from last year, um, or the year at least we have data from, which is two years before. Just yesterday, there was a, a Feed Ontario Hunger report uh, released, which uh, showed us again more of what we already know, that food bank use in Ontario um, was on the rise before COVID-19. So between April 2019 and, and March 2020, food bank increased by just over 53% from the previous year. And also with the onset of COVID-19, Ontario food banks saw a surge in demand with 26% increase in first time visitors. And that was just between March and June of 2020. And the latest predictions are that things are going to get even worse um, with the latest lockdowns in many places. Um, the other thing we've also heard is that many emergency food programs uh, across the country um, have reported staggering increases um, with many organizations offering food charity for the first time ever to meet the growing need. We know that these numbers are very likely underestimated um, with, with the sample that's, that's collected is not often reflecting populations that are the most, most struggling to put food on their tables. And something else we know is that these impacts are often extremely uneven. Uh, people that are economically insecure are experiencing more significant impacts. Data shows that this includes a disproportionate number of refugees, newcomers, migrant workers, and especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Black and Indigenous households are nearly three times more likely to be food insecure, and almost 50% of households on First Nation reserves are food insecure, not to mention more than 100 reserves that don't even have access to, to clean drinking water. So again, I, I hope this isn't new to you, but if it is, I hope it shocks you. I hope this, this, this really makes you uncomfortable, some of, this, some of these statistics. Um, but more important, I hope it makes clear that the volunteer-based, under-resourced emergency food charity systems did not have the capacity to address this incredible need, an incredible problem, and that it's, it's not working, <laughs> and it's not the solution to the problem. So a lot of these emergency food system, uh, emergency food programs, they don't provide enough food to meet those in needs. They, they're not serving the most food insecure and they don't address the underlying issues of poverty and, and, and equity. Really uh, very extreme, very challenging times. Uh, and the conversation, this conversation seems so much more important now than it has in, in a very long time. Uh, as in many places, the pandemic has revealed some of the worst features of our systems, but also uh, much, much hope and opportunity as communities we've seen come together to support each other. So here in Thunder Bay, many of us have uh, been having uh, some very, very serious discussion about the future of emergency food programs in the region. Uh, beyond these kind of individual conversations we've been having, we're currently working on a community food security uh, emergency food plan for the city, considering the different responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, what comes next? How do we move forward? So with that, I mean, we're, we're, we, we brought this panel together because we're really looking forward to hearing from others uh, about their thoughts on these issues and what they're doing. Um, and again, how we can move from, uh, from uh, access us from to equity and, and how we can reimagine emergency food programs on the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me now introduce uh, our three panelists who are going to be speaking. Uh, I'm not sure we actually agreed on an order, but I'll, I'll introduce them in this order and you, we can uh, decide if folks are going to um, 
go go in a different order in a second. Um, but first uh, on my list, I have uh, Sashoya Simpson, uh, who's a longtime resident of Jane Finch. Uh, she's an oral storyteller, animation writer, and theater performer. Uh, she has been working with the Black Creek Community Farm for the last four years in various capacities, uh, farm school, camp program assistant to, uh, to youth program coordinator, and now uh, the emergency food box program assistant. Um, next, we have uh, Catherine Scarf, uh, who's the Chief Program Officer and co-founder of Community Food Centers Canada. Uh, Catherine's worked for over 20 years in the community food security sector in Toronto, uh, from many vantage points, from grassroots work with community kitchens and alternative food distribution, through program development and initiatives aimed at uh, changing food systems uh, through food policy and action. And our third uh, speaker today is going to be Jess McLaughlin, uh, who's a member of Long Lake uh, 58 First Nations and grew up in McKenna, Ontario. Uh, she's the executive member with the Thunder Bay Area Food Strategy, where she played a really central and continues to play a central role in the founding and uh, development of the Indigenous Food Circle here in Thunder Bay uh, and, and in the region as well. Uh, and the Indigenous Food Circle, uh, just for you, those of you who don't know, and I'm sure she'll talk about this, is a, is a network of Indigenous-led, Indigenous-serving organizations that work collectively towards Indigenous food sovereignty um, in, in the region, self-determination. And Jess is also uh, on the board of Food Secure Canada and the co-lead of the Northern Ontario Indigenous Food Sovereignty Collaborative. So as you can see, these speakers bring a lot of uh, not just knowledge, but experience and uh, with that, I will turn it over to Joya. Do you want to go first? You can say no. <laughs> oh, but you're muted. And, oh, there. I'm going first. Is that okay? Um, Are you okay with that? Yeah, I can wing it. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay, great. It's all you. It's on me. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Joya Simpson, and as Charles mentioned. I've been with the farm for on and off for four years now, um, but I've been a resident of the Jane Finch community for the last 15 years. Um, so I've been living here since high school. So I've seen the changes in the community and most of them, not so much for the better to benefit the community itself. So which is also why I got involved more at the farm. So I'm gonna keep talking more, but first I'm gonna be sharing my screen. So you can follow along. Da, 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 da. Um, oh, I don't use this one. Oh, no, 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 no. oh. Uh, I'm going to keep talking, but I'm sorry. Uh, everything's just going a bit slow for some reason when it was going nice before. But you know, internet. Yes, can you see my screen fun, Charles? You can all good? Okay, amazing. So, coming with the emergency food program, I started, it came in when March is when it all started. So, it wasn't something we're prepared for. And we're not a charity, we're not a food bank here at the farm, but it's something we just had to take care of each other. So we know this is something we just had to jump into and started and come up with a system to work with your support. So working with this, some of the challenges we had to deal with was the fact that over 80% of the COVID numbers are in the northwest of Toronto. So up here where we are is massively impacted. And then looking at the factors of non-affordable housing, the over-policing, which is always constant in the neighborhood. And with the over-policing, what that does, because of so much negative um, stigma in the neighborhood over the years, it just perpetuates. The police are constantly in the neighborhood, too, and that just perpetuates the stigma that it's still an unsafe neighborhood, and it's still looked at as such. And then that also goes and ties in with the food apartheid. So, Looking at the fact that this neighborhood is mainly made up of racialized BIPOC folks who live on no low income, and the situation around that is the fact that the food prices are going up, yet there's still 
lot of the jobs around here are temp agencies, so the jobs are not secure at all. And uh, food prices going up, and the balance of it is very off. We can't afford so many of these things. So when we jumped in for the COVID, we did not expect the response we got. Um, Cause we jumped in, but we didn't expect that so many folks, even outside of the immediate Jane and Finch neighborhood, needed that support. So we really had to expand a lot. Um, and with partnership with Foodshare, we're able to come up with a program where we develop their food boxes. We organize the organization here at the farm, and the boxes, the delivery was taken care of by Foodshare. So overall, looking at the numbers I have here, we're able to deliver 13,689 boxes total, tons of food, over 2,000, 3,000 plus households, and individuals within those households impacted was over 80,000. And not just, and with this came about as a result of a lot of support from um, government bodies for funding, private organizations, individual organizations. And then there are the grassroots community folks on the ground level who literally came together doing different um, initiatives to be able to support our program as well. So a lot of it was very community-based because we are a bad community for community here at the farm. So a lot of it was it's still very difficult because then later on what happened is a lot of the granting bodies support a limited amount of funding for a certain period of time and then it becomes we have folks calling hey when am i getting my next food box and so forth but it's like balancing that with we don't have the funding right to be able to support so many of these things and i'm still getting emails of folks asking hey i know about your program how can we get added on and so forth but with over 3,000 families we can only support so much at a time so even though we do our best, it's like not everyone gets consistent food boxes, and it's really hard to balance that. But we were also able to get $50,000 in gift cards from the uh, Community Food Center Canada, which also we were able to mail those out to families as well as another means of support. And so right now, I believe we also got some more funding to be able to continue the program for another 12 weeks. Um, but at the same time, it's still not sustainable. It's still all very limited amount of time doing this. So yes, um, yes. So and then looking at another aspect of the food area is that a lot of the workers in the community are frontline workers. So a lot of these folks can't afford to really stay home because they have to go out to work. They're the grocery stores the nurses and all of these folks who work in these essential jobs that are constantly open during the COVID who have to go home and have to leave the house. And then transportation also adds another layer because in this neighborhood, the public transportation is very notorious. Um, it's been like this since I was in high school and it's still very bad. And even with the COVID situation, there's a construction happening right now in the middle of the neighborhood, right in the intersection. Um, going along, this is going to go on for another three, four years of uh, construction happening in the neighborhood, which is all the buses are on detour, the rails, and it's just a lot more traffic. And folks still have to leave their home to be able to go do shopping, go to work, and deal with all this. And then balancing with their kids at home right now with their homeschool and online situation, because within walking distance of the farm, we have paid schools. And so a lot of the programs we do also centers around the food security and environmental education for all ages. So we have programs for seniors, we have programs for children and adults, so all ages all around. And a lot of them are greatly impacted, especially when looking at our seniors who the social isolation for them, like especially with mental health and so forth, speaking with a lot of them, it's just not as you're hoping when they can come back to the farm to be out again, be able to play. And so we try our best to always make sure, check in with them, make sure they have their food boxes, gift cards, and different things. Because so many of them are so very scared, they do not leave their houses because they're so very scared. So we try our best to always check in, go to the building, make deliveries, and so forth. Um, I think I'm coming up on time, but, um, but yeah, it's been a very hectic 
period of balancing and also looking at ways to get additional funding. And even, we're going to talk more about the beyond area more um, in the feedback. But as you can see, having more food security, like lower price of food, because a lot of the food we have around here are fast food. We don't have access to healthy, fresh produce as much as other neighborhoods who are more in the downtown sector. So it's very difficult, and folks are going to automatically buy what's cheaper, which is the junk food, so we're not able to intake as much healthy food or have access, have access to it as, as we would like to. And the same with housing. It's like, let's just move the housing, but folks can't, even since some of the housing and then the lack of jobs also leads into that difficulty, right? So, and then the national food policy in those areas, a lot of things need to be rejected to be able to support, bring more support to the community and the work that we do here. We just when the farm is here. <laughs> it's been, the farm's been here, like the inception started back in 2012, um, and we've been here up until now, and it's been a lot of groundwork. Um, that we've been doing to get to this point. I'm going to share more information links to you to give you more history of the farm and a video where you can actually see the farm for yourself and get more information about it. Um, but yeah, it's been a trying time and trying to balance and among everything else, it's been, it's been great. Yeah. Well, not so much, but <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna stop here, but I'm gonna have more to talk about in the Q and Q and A section. But yeah, pass it back to Charles. Great, thanks, Ashoya. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know, I, I was we were just talking before folks came on. I used to live in Toronto, and the Black Creek Community Farm was such an inspiration for. Um, some of the programming and work that's happening there, and I, I really like Ashoya. At your beginning, you talked about like talked about by community, with community, for community, like all of that. Um, these are not top-down programs, but they really are, as, I, as I've watched them develop over, over time, is you know, really being rooted in, in the needs and the, the interests and the cultures and the identities and the history of the community itself, which is a really wonderful inspiration. So thanks for sharing. Um, do we wanna, Catherine, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hi. So yeah, I'm Catherine Scarf, um, and I'm coming to you from Toronto. Um, and uh, I work for Community Food Centers Canada. And in normal times, we work uh, all of the folks I can see on my screen at the moment. Anyway, so Shoya, just Gus, and uh, Charles slash Aaron and Thunder Bay are very typical organizations that we work with. We work with community-based grassroots organizations um, to build community food centers to support the broader food movement and also in policy and advocacy at the national level. And most, many, some of those partners have emergency food services, but um, many of them are centered more around the idea of building community, building health and inclusion and, um, and mental health and connection. So um, we are not really a, a network of food banks per se, though we do, well, not per se at all, uh, that we do have um, some members who are. So um, I was going to talk about the vulnerability, but I think Charles uh, painted a pretty good picture of what the pandemic has wrought when it comes to uh, what we've seen as vulnerability in our system. Um, we know that we were living in a chronic state of vulnerability. We were quite comfortable with the 4 million that chronically live in food insecurity. Uh, and then we just, you know, we, we need a shock like this to throw all of those people who are you know just on the precarious edge who have those low paying jobs or the precarious employment the part time jobs the small business owners and then of course the equity lens that you mentioned in terms of the, the especially pernicious effects on um, bipoc communities um so that's what we live with all the time uh the pandemic hit uh and all of a sudden we're ever we're panicking and we start throwing a whole bunch of things at the problem um, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, the system, the emergency food system, food banks and meal programs and that kind of thing, they were, they were supposed to be for an emergency, right? That's supposed to be kind of like, you know, if you've got a war, you know, a famine or something, you know, you need a system like that. But um, it wasn't a very, I'll talk a little bit more about the problems in the system. It's not a very robust system. So, um, but it was there and it's certainly better than nothing. So on the one hand, some food banks closed. 
uh, some, uh, lots of them ramped up and, um, and then also community organizations like Black Creek or like Roots to Harvest started to pivot towards emergency food because they were there uh, and they're close to the community and they have the reach into the community. So people, you know, it's it, a bit idiosyncratic what happened. Some things slowed down, other things picked up. The government, um, you know, in a smart move, uh, instituted the CERB uh, income benefit, which is much higher than say uh, social assistance, which people are trying to get by on every day. And we started to see a little bit of what the impact of that could be to buffer. I think that was an important lesson that we learned. You know, we heard from our partners in Caluit that they didn't see hardly any increase in emergency food services because the pandemic left them untouched for a while. They're now sadly in lockdown too, uh, and it's going badly there. But um, the, the CERB did what it was supposed to do there. It protected people from the shocks. Other places though, people were falling between the cracks and we talked about this enormous surge in need. I mean, our partners have seen like about a 44% surge in in need. So we were the recipients of both a lot of um, foundation largesse, a huge amount of government funding um, to the, a total of about $30 million, which we distributed. First, we went sort of through our core parts outwards. So our 15 community food centers, our 200 food organizations we work with. And then we just had to you know, put out the broader call to see who, who else is out there that we're, that we're missing. So we ended up giving out um, grants to about a thousand organizations and about, uh, we think about 500,000 people were, were impacted that way. So again, it's, you know, let's, let's say it's better than nothing for sure. Um, but um, I just wanted to say, before I go more to the big butts, I wanna to go to the, the good part. Like, so what we saw from the community-based organizations and how, you know, they were able to continue to add the kind of like so they uh, they started giving out hampers meals to go delivery services to people's homes and that kind of thing but then there was also a lot of creativity and a lot of what you call the kind of special thing that happens in community organizations where every, like programs had layers and as soon as you could get people out into markets there was outdoor markets there were gardens there was you know notes and baskets there were people from advocacy offices calling people to check up on them how are you you know and making them feel a little bit more connected people did online cooking programs for kids where they could pick up a box of food take home a big basket go online and um and, and do something together and then they maybe have a like a much bigger supply of food that they could use so there was like you know and, and Sushoya talked about what black creek has done which is just immense like it's been huge uh, in a really, really important uh, neighborhood in Toronto. So, you know, people have done an amazing job. Um, you know, I'm just will talk a lot more about what's uh, the Indigenous community's response has been, but there's been really um, where money could reach communities, and that was a challenge uh, in some ways, but there were land based approaches, approaches that were more congruent with food sovereignty than emergency food. Um, so some of the problems I think that we've learned about that maybe I hope they're not just obvious or maybe it's better if they are obvious, which is that the emergency food, the call to emergency food is seductive, right? It's seductive on an, for individuals because it makes you feel like you're making a tangible uh, contribution if you give to a food bank or whatever. And I think we have to honor that because it's, a, it's not a bad impulse and, and without knowing what else to do, then contributing to a charitable effort is, is a an, an amazing thing to do in a way. <laughs> but of course, with all of this money that is going into these programs, you know, of course the concern is that we're doubling down on the system. So now even organizations that weren't doing emergency aid are doing it. We're buying, like programs are buying refrigerators and paying for warehouses and more trucks and so on. And I think there's a concern that we could end up with a system in search of a, in search of a raison d'etre after the pandemic's over when all of these things, even we've heard from boards of organizations that are really committed to community building. Some of the board members who are maybe a little bit less politically oriented, a little bit less, know less about systems and so on are saying, oh, this is great. Look at the work that we're doing. It makes me feel so good. Maybe we should continue to do more of this work after the pandemic. It's like, ah. I want to highlight a little bit of a contradiction though, which is this idea that because the, um, what we did in the last round of funding that we did, what we've been working throughout to try to prioritize Indigenous communities because we've been working with an Indigenous network and smallish, but you know, knowing of the food security crisis and so on, we've been trying to do that. And then Black Lives Matter and everything, and we should have been 
on it already, but we decided to do a very BIPOC focused round of funding and so on. So, but in order to do that, we, you know, and to reach into those communities, like you kind of have to do the thing I'm talking about that we don't want to do, which is to create more charitable food systems, right? So some indigenous communities, some went to land-based, but others didn't have charitable food infrastructure. So they have to start something up, right? And they also need equipment to do that. So, um, or, you know, for example, you might have an organization that reaches South Asian moms group or something, and they're not usually an emergency food program. But in this, if you want to be equitable in this moment, you have to like try and find them and give them resources so that they can pivot that way. So it's just a bit of a paradox that I wanted to flag there about, you know, getting the reach that you need. The other thing we learned though, giving out those grants and, and having to, you know, we had a grant system in place that it enabled us to be able to pivot so we could give out all this huge sum of money. At first we were like, oh my God, this is more money than we've ever, ever seen. Like it's like four times our annual budget. It's just such an immense amount of money. Of course, you immediately see how it's not an immense amount of money. It doesn't go very far. And the impossibility of, of actually gauging the need relative, one organization versus another organization, one city versus another city, Everybody me measures everything differently. Some people don't have any benchmarks because they never did it before. You know, people want numbers and it's impossible to judge where the need really is, you know, and that's because all of these systems are not created with the types of metrics or the types of systems that are required. Charles mentioned, you know, volunteer run or whatever. I mean, it was so important that the organizations that we worked with that did pivot were able to have, that did have staff. That's why they were able to do all these things that I talked about, because those staff were there, professional staff that were being paid. So um, how are we for time? Is it time to wrap or a little more? Uh, I'm, I'm not officially keeping track, so. Uh... And I, I can't see Erin right now. So she said she'd chat me if I was blabbling. I'll go just a little bit. Um, I don't have too much else to say. So. We did do a survey of um, our community food centers, which we do every year. And this year we, uh, we had to scale it back. We couldn't go interview people, but we did telephone, our partners did telephone surveys. Um, we uh, surveyed about 400 people and, um, and got a bit of a sense. And I'll just give you a few of the stats that we got from that, um, which is that 34% said it was harder to access healthy food. 44%, uh, sorry, I already said that, 31% um, called said they were very isolated, 23% uh, uh, employment income had reduced, 29% um, said their physical health had decreased, 39% said their mental health had decreased. I mean, this is probably not surprising for any of us as individuals also experiencing this pandemic, but I'm sure we can imagine how much worse, if many of us on this call might in fact be in that situation, but how much worse it is when you don't have the option of some income to access whatever you can access. Um, and then we also found like community food centers, and again, that's just a proxy in this case for all the organizations that do this type of work, that they are an important place for people. Even, you know, people were coming to the parking lot and waving at each other across the parking lot, and the staff were there, and when they were People had to line up, which we're always trying to prevent people from having to line up, but they'd have to line up outside and they would talk to people in the line and give them referrals to other agencies. So the importance of this kind of community infrastructure really was highlighted as well. So going forward, you know, we did a report before the one I just mentioned um, that we've been trying to push out there with policy ad, um, um, recommendations in it, and I hope people will check it out. It's available at uh, beyondhunger.ca. And it looks at, um, we looked at 500 people and their experience of food insecurity, not just as a sort of hunger or even worry about food, but all of the, the deeper impacts on your psych, you know, your psychological health, your family relationships, your, your ability to express your culture, your um, ability to just aspire to anything in life. And, and then connected to that, we said, you know, we need to start looking at the policy solutions that are systemic. We, we can't fix this problem, be it food banks or community programs at the grassroots. We need social policy. We need, we're calling for a working age tax benefit to, to target some of the big chunk of people in the middle that are, are left out as a way to start looking at a basic income floor beneath which nobody can drop. If you hit every demographic, kids, seniors, as we do with certain, like this, the um, child tax benefit and the seniors benefit. And if we, if we can, uh, get more support, um, more income for that working age group, we're gonna to start to work towards 
a bit of a net that's more that has more income security in it. And we hope that there's also a broader conversation about a basic income. Uh, we're not quite ready to jump onto it yet because the devil will be in the details there. So um, yeah, have a check out those the policy recommendations there. Um, and then maybe we can come back to there may be some things we can do around grassroots programs and emergency programs too to make them more you know, as long as we have to live with them to make them um, better, basically, be they food banks or community programs. But again, we're not going to fix the problem at that level. That's it. <laughs> Great, thanks, Catherine. It, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to some of that uh, shortly. But before we do that, I'll turn it over to Jess McLaughlin. Hi, Jess. Hey, Charles. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, so uh, hi, Buju. My name is Jess Malachlan. I am in Thunder Bay on the traditional territory of the Fort Wayne First Nation people of Um uh, I work for the Indigenous Food Circle, kind of still. Um, so, the, I guess the story that I wanted to kind of share today. Um, around, you know, the topic of food, <laughs> food is like access to like equity is around, it starts with the circle. So the circle is a group of 25 indigenous led or indigenous serving organizations in Thunder Bay. Um, and uh, we don't normally do food security work. We actually focus on food sovereignty and uh, a little, I guess we've touched in the past food security work, but, uh, or food access work, but really uh, it's been about uh, helping indigenous communities really have the tools to, uh, uh, to be sovereign nations and not really de depend on the industrial food supply chain or, or others telling them what to do with their food system. Um, so this just one slide, I guess I wanted to start off by talking about how inequitable it was at the beginning of the, of the, of the pandemic for the circle. You know, Charles, you can maybe attest to, we may have less money in our budget, but we had around 10 to $15,000, maybe less, maybe seven. I don't really know. So I, I don't know, Charles, if you want to pipe in there, um, but, uh, but I, I don't know what the budget was, but we were very small, right? And we had a very small staff that we pay fragmentedly. So, but we do, we have a great impact. So right here, I'm just talking about inequity in a nonprofit, right? Like looking at the way the circles run, we, we carry a great uh, impact through the work because the work is meaningful and the work is relationship driven. Um, so I guess in our COVID response, I, I, I kind of put them in order. But um, so the first one was we, we do a project in collaboration with the Thunder Bay District Health Unit, uh, which is funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care through the Northern Fruit and Vegetable Program. Uh, so one of the first things that we did in the response was talk to um, that the Ontario Ministry and in, with a bunch of people, like the health units were there, um, the Ontario Growers Association, to ensure that this program continued. So what it does in a regular year is put a fresh fruit and a fresh veg in a school once a week uh, from January to June. Um, so when the pandemic hit, it actually stopped for a couple of weeks and we were like, hey, why, not, why stop sending food in the most uh, vulnerable time? So we were key in a bunch of organizations reallocating some of that money and getting that to the communities as well. Number two, um, and so like, I guess in highlighting, like, you know, there was no need for that to stop in the first place. Uh, I don't know where the misconnection in, in government bureaucracy happens, but we all know that food was the topic of a question why was the program that actually hits vulnerable people stopped in the first place so number two um, we did turn to uh, um, emergency food response here um, through that project the understanding our food systems project we work with um, the good food box here locally and had funding from the Th Thunder Bay Community Foundation to do good food boxes for uh, 14 First Nations in the Robinson Superior Treaty 9 areas um, which I don't have those numbers, but we, uh, I'm, I was laughing at Sawyer's uh, slides because I was like, I have no numbers. Um, but um, is, we, did, we, we did, I think maybe 10 good food boxes in different First Nations, um, some First Nations up to 300 good food boxes um, during like the, the midst of the pandemic. Um, 
during all this time, what was also happening with uh, some of the circles that I roll in, some of the food circles I roll in was uh, the federal response, the provincial response, and the regional response, and the interprovincial response. So we have great relations with uh, Northern Manitoba. And so we often help each other with funding policies or philanthropist policies that are happening here in Northern Manitoba and Northern Ontario, because they're a lot similar. Um, but I wanted to note and uh, of the federal response. So the federal response was to uh, to, to look at access. Uh, fortunately, the federal government did put some money into the um, Community Food Centers Canada, who had a different um, uh, hat on in, in, in allocating funding to uh, organizations with uh, lesser stri less strict um, parameters around delivering. Um, it, it wasn't just about food or access to food. It was about, hey, let's think of sustainability. Like Catherine talked about those freezers, fridges, um, gardening supplies, things uh, on the land kind of stuff like that. Um, uh, so we were able to, uh, I think when Catherine was talking about this, this federal response, and I don't know if anyone's really familiar, I'm sure lots of you are, but there was, you know, a large $100 million response. Um, and, and, uh, a lot of indigenous folks at a national level thought that you know there wasn't a lot of indigenous engagement done or even and even if there was engagement it wasn't really like um listened to um my colleague dr joseph leblanc also often talks about the federal government has a direct link to all the first nations bank accounts in canada it was easy to get those communities their money directly rather than put it into food banks canada or cfcc no offense catherine but i'm just saying is for really thinking about the way um access and, and allowing people to determine their own food systems um especially in an emergency um you would think the communities knew best how to uh do that for themselves. Um, another thing, so th during the Understanding Our Food Systems response, we, we normally host a big gathering, so we did a whole bunch of gatherings online. Catherine talked about those beautiful things about cooking with kids, online gatherings, uh, stuff like that. So we did a lot of that. Um, we did receive a lot of funding some from CFCC. So uh, just quickly, we received a crisis fund, which was about $50,000, $50, which we got to, to hit some really vulnerable communities. So communities that had deaths that may not have had a bulk purchase of food around families for the next two weeks to not have to worry about food while they were dealing with um, family issues. And we did that for, I, I wrote down my numbers. I did have numbers for this. 12 First Nations and technically touched roughly 5,000 people. Um, and closely, um, over 600 people closely like family units um, during all this time i just want to say that there's also this other thing going on which is the establishment of the northern ontario indigenous food sovereignty collaborative which is i'm the new co-lead for this with alex boulet um, from sudbury so what this organization is hoping to do is really to decolonize the way funding looks. So uh, a lot of, I think, what's been happening through the pandemic and what's happening in the food world um, comes out in organizations like this that are able to grant to communities in a really different hat um, where uh, it's relationship driven. I know communities, we know communities, we ask communities and they tell us. Um, and then I just want to say that we've done two, oh, there's, I'm actually missing two on here, but we've done in Thunder Bay, the Indigenous Food Circle did a crisis response, which then led to what Charles was talking about in the beginning was an emergency food response plan for Thunder Bay with, in collaboration with the city and the Thunder Bay and area of food strategy, which the circle sits on. And then lastly, it was our big chunk of funding from CFCC, which, um, really uh, looked at the remote First Nations where we were able to do some really incredible work with buying uh, gardening supplies and on the land stuff. Um, I guess what I'm saying is what the circle did with limited money in the beginning, and, and I'm not saying that there's a lot of money and tied in here for staff, believe me, we pieced together staff money like you wouldn't believe, but is that, you know, we are able to, although our budgets are small and although we're always scrambling, we're able to still focus on sustainability in the future. We're not really, we have done and touched emergency access food, but we're always helping our community think about the future rather than saying like, do you need a, a, a do you need a good food box program or do you need a, a program for traditional harvesting of meat? Like giving options and really putting those self-determined ideas in communities' heads when they're just there. Um, so I think we've been able to do that through the pandemic and I hope to be able to do that further through the collaborative. Um, I just wanted to share some pictures of some stuff that happened. Um, sorry, I don't know if I used up all my time or I talked really fast. 
Um, so these are all like the pictures during the pandemic. So uh, in the top here, I think you can see me. This is in Kanugaming. These are the day we packed 370 boxes. This is a plane filled of food going to Kaseshwan. This is Red Rock Indian Band packing good food boxes. Deer Lake First Nation doing their garden before the snow. Uh, a fridge in Slate Falls, packing in Gull Bay, me sitting on Sandy Lake's tractor, a family in White Sand First Nation um, building their garden or at their garden this year. Um, we were able to do two online workshops to share with a, a range of people. Um, and here's some more pictures from communities. Uh, Pays Platt Hall down here on the bottom, Bits of Guns to uh, Potato Gardens and Tires, Gnugaming with Kim McGibbon from Roots to Harvest, Shelby and Pays Platt's uh, new kitchen, and, uh, and Good Food Box and Beats of Gun, Nishnabek. Um, oh, and more. And look at all our, um, and this is stuff that we've done all through the pandemic. So, um, preserving, learning about trapping, and you can see our socially distanced pictures there. Um, all at Roots to Harvest uh, Farm. Uh, anyways, and I think that's it. And we'll talk more in the questions. Great, thanks, Josh. And I'll just, I'll just mention, um, Aaron, I think, put the Understanding Our Food Systems website in the chat. It's a, a, few, a few pieces up. Uh, and in that, if you go to that website, actually, the videos of the Winona LaDuke event and the uh, <laughs> Jess and Shelby doing the Get That Costume and Squash seed saving and preparation are in there. They're wonderful to watch. Uh, not just entertaining, but also very educational as well, both videos. Um, so thanks all three. Um, I think I'm gonna, I, I think the plan is for me to ask the first question uh, to get things going. Um, and I wanted to ask something that, and I didn't, we didn't, I didn't give this in advance. I didn't pre-plan it. Um, but something that struck me about the three, your three perspectives is that you're, and this wasn't planned this way, but again, I think you're talking about very different uh, or different scales of action and, and response, right? So Catherine, you were talking um, because of the nature of the work you do, you know, you're talking about a kind of cross Canada uh, perspective. And actually I, was, I wanted to ask specifically about some of the, the, the policy recommendations that you, that you had in that report and some of the things you're thinking about. Um, Jess, you were talking specifically about a kind of regional approach to Northern Ontario and specifically around First Nations. And so Shoya, you were speaking very specifically about a neighborhood and rooting things in a neighborhood and in the, in the community uh, needs and, and community responses. So I guess I wanted, so th that's not actually my question. My question is around if you could each maybe speak a little bit to some, um, either whether it's like solutions, whether it's like, like long-term, whether it's programming, uh, maybe government responses, policy implications, like what do you see as a way to ensure that the crisis that people were facing pre-COVID-19, we don't go back to that kind of same kind of big scare quotes normal that, you know, where people were already in really difficult situations. How, how do we see moving forward out of this uh, you know, in, into a place of equity. And again, I want, so I'm at, that's the question. So I'm just asking if you have any, any one or two maybe examples of what that might look like or how you see that. Um, but specifically thinking about the kind of regions that or the scales that you were talking about, whether it's the national scale, the regional scale, so show you the neighborhood scale. And, and are those, I'm also wondering, are those even compatible? Can you have universal national solutions that actually meet the needs of First Nations or meet the needs of neighborhoods? Or are those things possibly contradictory? So, uh, so Shoya, can we start with you? We'll go, maybe we'll go you and then Jess and then maybe back to Catherine at the end, if that's okay. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, for me, if I look at it from what we've been experimenting, uh, we've been looking at different ways to implement um, different community gardens throughout the neighborhood. So if folks are able to have access to space to grow their own food, that's one way we could do that, right? But because the neighborhood also has a lot of apartment buildings, it's very difficult because sometimes we're limited to not use our bathrooms and so forth. But if we're able to have spaces in the neighborhood, because there are a lot of folks who go surplus produce at their own gardens from their houses. And one of the programs we have at the farm, the Urban Harvest Around Black Creek program. So we that program they will collect the surplus produce from residents and then that will get donated to other residents in need. And with that program a lot of workshops take place where they show canning food preservation and a lot of that, which we had a large increase of with the COVID situation, which is surprising because so much folks were able to access it easier online, um, but we were able to demonstrate a lot more. And there are so many community leaders we have, were able to give you 
teach different recipes and give access to a lot of these things where you can go to freeze your food, ways to preserve and make your food last longer. So, but even at this farm, going back to what I was saying before, at this farm, we do have spaces where folks are able to go, like, get a plot here and just grow their own food. But with the COVID, that's closed off because we have to close the farm from the public. But if folks are able to have access to their own gardening spaces, then they're able to be able to access fresh food for themselves and grow that. Right? So, because the supermarkets are, the prices are going up and it's very difficult, especially for folks who have larger families. So we are trying to find different ways. But even at the farm, if we're able to even build our own community kitchen here, we don't have our access to our own certified kitchen. But if we're able to get that here, then we're even able to open up more to community to have a space where you can come to learn, cook, recipe, grow, and do all of that. So just be able to pass on knowledge and information of how to grow your own food, preserving and making your food last longer goes a long way. Right, so that's one thing we are constantly working with as well, and yeah, and that's why we also start from the children all the way up, and the seniors. It's great for them because not a lot of them have access. That's why we have community garden spaces where the seniors are able to grow their things. But with the COVID, a <laughs> um, lot of that becomes very difficult. But yeah, we're definitely looking at different ways to be able to build more sustainable structures and systems that will keep things going forward but we definitely just need access to space in the community which is very limited to us on a city and provincial level like because we have so many things that takes up a lot of space in the neighborhood like different lands that are open but we don't have access to those things because we have a team a research um, coordinator who does looking for different ways to for BIPOC folks to be able to own the land that they can go on within the neighborhood area. So we're looking at different ways to bring that in, to be able to get access to those things, which funding also comes into play when it comes to that. But that's something we're looking forward to so we can own land on staff to be able to grow and develop our own food system. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks so much, Shoya. So Shoya. And uh, I should mention, so Shoya also put uh, the video and the podcast in the link too. So if you scroll up in your chat box, there's a couple links there which uh, talk more about those programs. Um, thank you. So Jess, can I turn it to you with that same question of just like, what are, what are the directions we need to go in terms of really moving to ensure we don't, we don't end up right back where we started? Mm, did you not ask to like, is this not like a blanket? It, Cause like it isn't a blanket situation. We all know like, and I'm sure everyone on this call knows if like how interconnected the food system is to everything like land, like, um, like capitalism, like all these things that like impact our food system. So it is for me, not just, um, a blanket approach it's like a multi-level government approach like right down to my indigenous part like indigenous communities like you know within band councils making those choices to for a proactive food system um you know each level changes like even at an urban level like we think of like like when indigenous folks want to access wild game within the city of Thunder Bay, you know, like the hoops and the hurdles they have to go through. Although we work with the Thunder Bay District Health Unit on that, you know, especially in a time of COVID, I think it would be even more difficult. But I think these little small legislations and policies and, and like from indigenous community to municipal to provincial to um, federal um, really impact. So without uh i guess like a chain reaction or some sort of changes within these things we are going to continue to be in this like you know i think one thing that COVID did though that we're not gonna like that we will we're on our way out of this little thing is that people are starting to realize like like you know charles we often have that conversation around the way climate change is put on the individual well my food like you know although i want to determine my own food system there has to be supports in that for me um and so i think what COVID has done is really informed individuals to say like no i'm taking that back and and i think like maybe if we're here in another two years you know there's more of us on this call who are able to push those kind of policies at all those levels of government um i hope that answers the question mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and 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 so yeah, and maybe and as I pass it over to Catherine, uh, and also if folks have other questions or things they want to bring up, please put them in the chat. And Aaron, I think is going to come back on in a minute and bring those. Um, so Catherine, yeah, I want to pose that question to you. I know you mentioned a few of these kind of bigger policy recommendations. I'd love maybe if you want to, if you are able to to put a few of them out. But I think maybe and I'll maybe put the hard this harder question onto you as well as like hearing a bit from. Sushoya and Jessica about these kind of different kind of scales in which they're working. Um, and I'm seeing uh, Gary just in the chat box. I was just reading that, you know, this concerns about not having a national program, but also the limitations of a national program. Um, yeah, anyway, if you could speak a bit to that, I think. Uh, yeah, well, so not every, everything can be everything. <laughs> not something, something cannot be everything. So we, uh, we work at the national level primarily and we try to find policies that will, that will, you know, we can't work with every, we just don't have the capacity. We're relatively, relatively large capacity, but still it's just, it's the scale of working and social assistance in particular uh, is such a huge um, barrier, like social system, systems across and a huge cause of poverty. So I mean, in the future, we may look at, at trying to work more at that level, but for the time being, we've been trying to find national, national policies that would have some application um, across all, for all of our partners. Um, I'd like to just use the upstream, downstream, and midstream, um, you know, uh, metaphor, if you will, to talk about this. So this question, um, you know, people know, I'm probably well familiar with this idea of like, you know, the babies are turning up at the bottom of the stream. Why are they turning up at the bottom of the stream? Well, you need to build a fence at the top of the stream. So that, and the fence is the policy so that people can't throw in the babies. And then I like to add in the midstream, which I feel is like the community programs that build the life rafts for the babies, right? Before you can throw the babies onto the life rafts. So that could be, you know, all these like amazing community programs, but there's only so many life rafts you can build, no matter how much money you put into grassroots programs. Again, there's only so many life rafts you can build. And then there's the downstream, which is just like dealing with the, the worst impacts of basic, like the lack of basic needs, the food banks and so on. So on the upstream level, it is about social policy, um, be, it, be it federal, provincial, maybe even, maybe even municipal. Um, and I would say that income security, again, is the kind of necessary but not sufficient condition for food security. So you need to have income security for most Canadians to be able to be food secure. That said, Indigenous communities have a very particular reality and there needs to be a very particular approach because of the, the whole question of land and um, recovering uh, sovereignty and food traditions. So, um, because not, you know, if you don't have, like, no amount of money in certain communities in Canada is actually going to enable you to be food secure or, or food sovereign, because it's not really about money, it's about maybe access to a store or access to, um, to country foods and so on, which are also have other importance beyond even just food access, but cultural, um, uh, sovereignty and cultural, uh, I'm just losing a word I'm looking for, but um, they're important at a cultural level. Um, so that's upstream. So at, you know, for those, for income security, we do need to have some kind of, um, you know, a patchwork of, of systems that is on both on the kind of monetary side, be it tax policies that put more money back into people's pockets, like I was mentioning the child tax benefit, working age tax credit, or, um, you know, guaranteed income for seniors. Um, and our preference is to sort of try to have more of a bit of a patchwork and a network of things on the income side and then also on the affordability side, things that give people in kind access to housing, to daycare, to pharmacare, and those kinds of things, in part because they're harder to take away. You just, you just like dissolve all of the systems and you just write people one check and then you're like, hey, go buy your, go buy your medicine, go buy your daycare, go, you know, that money won't go very far. So our preference to creating at this point, we saw like a really good faith, really strong proposal for universal income, one check, dismantle all the systems to pay for it. Our personal, our, our personal, our organizational preference at the moment is more to have this kind of mix of, of programs of income security and so on. Midstream, we need to acknowledge the value of these community programs that are very specifically relevant to the communities that they're in, be they urban ag, be they, you know, it's all this grassroots infrastructure we were talking about and that, that involves a certain type of philanthropy and a certain, you know, and government support. We need to move towards more generous philanthropic models that are based on trust and core funding and things that create stability for these organizations and recognize that they're not these fragile 
volunteer run organizations and that they have. Um, so I think, you know, during the, during COVID, you know, it was far better to give $400,000 to the indigenous food circle to do what they needed to do or uh, in there, in all these communities that we couldn't possibly know the needs of or reach, than it would be to, for us to give $5,000 to, you know, well, however many organizations, like based on what knowledge. So there's, there's a kind of philanthropic aspect. And then I do think that there's stuff about the emergency food system that I don't really want to presume to know about because it's not my daily work. I've never worked, I mean, the, when I worked at the stop in Toronto, we did have a food bank, but like, um, you know, there's, there's ways in which that system could regulate itself in terms of the quality of the food, the efficiency of like, so that there were certain, you know, standards for all of the food banks um, and, you know, uh, standardization of service and and so on but that's really for for food banks and many are are progressive and are trying to do that kind of thing so I wouldn't say they're not doing it but I think that there's solutions at that level downstream thanks Catherine um, okay before I turn it back to Aaron with some questions Sashoya or Jessica do you want to do you want to respond to any of that or Okay, well, I will hop in and um, I have one, I have a couple of questions here lined up. So I'm just going to put them in order and people can continue to send them to me privately if you like, or just in the chat box. Um, so one of the questions comes from Doug West, who's in Aurelia. Um, and Doug was actually one of the founders of Roots to Harvest way back when. Um, so he says, in other times of economic upheaval, people have turned to forming sharing programs and cooperatives that focus on bulk food buying, community food preparation, etc. Do you see it as a time as a shift for this in Canada? Is it a time to shift back towards this in Canada? I wonder if any of you want to comment on that. Uh, one thing I find interesting is that with our urban harvest program, a lot of this happens within that program. Because within that program, we have a lot of community elders that actually have a lot of food that they come together, this program, this surplus, and all of that. And they do um, community preparation together, all of them, on a thing, whether it's the canning, the meal, the cooking, and all these different things, and sharing different recipes, and doing all of this work. So I'm not sure if we're going to be going back to that fully, but I feel there's a lot of implementation slowly happening within our system right now, probably not necessarily, that it could become something that's more normalized, which could happen so we have a more secure buying system, more so than panic buying whenever something like this happens to us. Um, so yeah, it, it will slowly be something that's integrated, because even growing up in Jamaica, and even on the African continent, a lot of the food comes community together to prepare and cook and share together, and a lot of us eat. Um, so it could be something we could consider for sure. Because I've always been around it growing up. So. Go for it, Jess. Do you want to comment on it? Sure. Um, I, you know, like, in the north, in the remotes, I did see lots of bulk buying, but it was like it was bulk buying by community, so it wasn't bulk buying by household, right? So you're still like there's still that like level of security at the household level that really can't do the bulk buying. And in past projects, like before COVID, it was in in the more of the communities, it's mostly communities members that worked predominantly that could do bulk buying, um, and it may not interest them. Um, I I think like really it's about what communities want one thing that i will say is like uh, even if we were bulk buying in like the north of northern ontario there's no way to ship it man like the shipping i like literally need to sit down with like all the heads of the airlines and like figure out what the heck's going on and because like that was our biggest deterrence is like shipping so like yeah okay i could get a a food order to i know what kanina is gonna i I don't know. I thought Kanina was going to put in a thing about the regional distribution anyways. Um, but as, cause we're looking for solutions here. Like how do we ship better? Because like, if I wanted to buy bulk buy for one community, like my cost of shipping are double what I paid for my food. So it's kind of silly in a way. Um, but I mean, 
yeah, I don't really see a lot of communities do it, doing that um, yet, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, What's I want to pipe thing? in there too. I, I mean, I feel like when those local, ba those local and kind of citizen driven, um, volunteer based, cooperativist projects work, they're like the very best thing ever. But the problem is, is like, we've kind of lost the skills to do that. And we live in this, like in this market-based system where like the, the regular food system is so cheap. The moment you're into the, you know, natural food co-op buying club situation, you're paying a lot more and, and, and then you have sort of an elitist problem in your hands. Or as you say, like, like the regular food system is just so cheap. You can't kind of compete with that. I mean, you can certainly have gardens and things, but I just find like in my experience over time, I've just seen them really kind of, they come and they go, they wax and they wake and they're just not on the scale. Like we need to institute, I guess I'm a bit more of a, like a state socialist really. Like we need to institutionalize either in organizations or in government, some of these, these programs to, to reach the scale that we need to. Great. So thanks all of you. Um, another one that comes in, and I think that it ties to, there's two that are a little, little bit similar, but um, let me I'll just give you the context of the question. Just coming from a low income immigrant family and growing up in the GTA, um, finding that food banks are fairly inaccessible in, the, in some areas, and they often fail to cater to the needs of their primary audience, even as such as newcomers, by providing culturally diverse foods as well as nutritious foods in general. And just speaking even from Thunder Bay, we have found this to be widely uh, an issue going on here now too. Sometimes you really don't know what to do with all that tomato paste, which is a good joke. Um, so he says, I, or she says, I think that the way food banks are funded and the donation halls framework aren't really cutting it as people tend to donate whatever they haven't used in their pantry. What are some of the ways that we can address these issues? And, and maybe I'll just tie this to the, the other one is what actually, like, you know, if we're looking at from access to equity, what does equity actually look like on the ground? Like, how do we get to equity if we were like to redo this from the start? I mean, I just don't think you can attack equity through the emergency food system. You just, you just can't. Like you can't fix it. It will never be, it, it should always be there only for the worst emergencies. Um, and, and then it should be the best possible version of that with the most culturally appropriate, the healthiest food and the least stigmatizing procedures. But you're never going to get to equity because there's inherently going to be lack of, of choice and um, you know, a different food system that is there for a different worse food system because of the stigma that is just is really hard to get rid of even when you have a very progressive food bank. I could go on, but I'm gonna stop. Well, I just to, to the question, like I really love the tomato paste comment, but it's like, it's the reshift in the way people, like, I, I mean, there are so many, just like Catherine said, so many nuances in that and in, in how to get from act, access to equity. And you're right, not in the emergency food system. But if you're thinking in the way people donate in Canada and what the, what the federal government said when they put out $500 million, I mean, $100 million is donate to Food Banks Canada. Donate to Breakfast Clubs of Canada. Donate to these organizations because that's where it is. So people donate craft dinner and food, tomato paste and whatever. Well, what about donating to organizations like CFCC or Roots to Harvest or local-based organizations? How are we shifting the way we donate when we have that to donate? I don't know. I don't think that's the answer, Erin, but I'm just saying it really like that comment about tomato paste really made me because that's annoying and not fair. <laughs> Um, I just thought it was important to reflect on what you said earlier about the, um, what Joseph LeBlanc had said about if government had wanted to give out funds to indigenous communities, they could have done it pretty easily, right? And, you know, the reason, and that's, I just think it's a really good example of equity versus access. That would have been, and, you know, he proposed and others perhaps don't want to give all the credit, but like, the idea that there would be a formula based on you know the size the size of your community and certain indicators and the remoteness factor and so on and then it would be and that's how in fact i believe some of the money that indigenous intermediaries did give it out so that's sort of that's a, a more equitable approach um i mean it's, 
there's a whole like layers of equity, but anyway, but the reason is like, so if you give out, so you have $30 million to give out to indigenous communities. If you give it out on that kind of a formula through that way, you will have pennies per person. And that's, it's just not enough money. You have to be, if you want an equitable approach, you have, you get what you pay for. You have to put in place social programs, basic income programs, tax programs that are worth billions, like we've seen during this pandemic, billions of dollars, not a hundred million, which again, as community people were like, ah, so much money. In fact, it's not much money. And that's why we can't, as well, we, it's easier to work through the emergency food system because the very patchworkness of it makes it affordable, you know, to, to do. Yeah, for sure, because, oh, oh, me? Um, yeah, because if, looking at indigenous in neighborhood, if the government wanted to support this neighborhood, it could have long time ago, because um, there have been so many different organizations and the that have been doing work for years to better the neighborhood, and instead, the result is a lot of gentrification instead. We're getting a lot of that instead of just building up the neighborhood with folks who are here and giving the community what it needs to be able to sustain instead of gentrifying and trying to build it to fit outside the neighborhood downtown and just really trying to make it more and more to them and just giving folks sustainable life here pretty much. Okay, so I, I uh, Aaron messaged me that I get to ask another question. Um, and and uh, we'll, we'll probably uh, wrap it up soon um, if unless there, unless there's more questions coming in. Um, so my question is actually a question that I get asked all the time around this time of year, and I want to I want to ask you because it's something I've been thinking a lot lately. Um, and that is, you know, this is the time of year when we start seeing, you know, sounds of the season and all the Christmas drives and, you know, everyone's asking, you know, it's Giving Tuesday and you know, everyone's, you know, people are asking for donations and money and supports. And, you know, so I get these, qu the question I get is, you know, knowing what we know, which is what we've just been talking about, about the limitations of the emergency food sector and, um, you know, a real need to kind of, you know, think about issues of equity what what do we what can the, what should the average per what should the person on the street do if they want to be if they have either money or time to to donate to volunteer to do something at this time of year um what what recommendations can we give people um that 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 want to like that recognize there's an issue and want to do something about it Can I, I'm just going to add one thing to that, Erin, I didn't put my video on. I, I really like that question because I think the question that I would like to just add, as if all of you could think about this, is what can we also be asking our charitable organizations who are asking to meet this need, what can we expect from them? Or what can we, like I actually feel like, and as a charity, we get let off the hook quite easily versus like, it's just good. Whatever you're doing, it's just good. Great job. But like, I actually feel like if you actually look critically, you know, at us and our values, like what should people be looking for? Like, I'm going to give or I'm going to do something or I'm like, what can we critically ask that sector to be able to, you know, hit it on the nail and not steer everybody towards this food system that is just like, it's easy to say, like, we're feeding hungry people. So, you know, I just wanted to take that on to your question, Charles, because I think it's something that comes up for me personally. And it's me that I see in the world that drives me nuts. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. My suggestion is that people should have more, more than one filter. If they're, so on the, if on the individual charitable giving side, in terms of putting your money into a cause, you should give, people should give to organizations like Black Creek Community Farm, like Roots to Harvest, um, that you can, where you can see that there's more, there, impact is not only being measured in pounds of food, that they have other layers of, of impact that they're trying to create, that access, food access may be part of it, but it's not the whole picture, so that it's a more, um, and, and then they have some kind of a, that they're trying to give their community voice, and, you know, and, and some sort of say in, in politics, and then on the other thing they should do, of course, is call their MP, and, you know, 
I'll make another plug for beyondhunger.ca because you know you can go there, read a bunch of policy recommendations, and then you can connect directly to your MP, send them an email, or pick up the phone. And you know, it's a hard thing to do, and it's kind of like wah, wah, boring old democracy, but it's it's still what we need to do to uh, to try to make change. They eventually will listen to us if we if we do speak up. I agree with Catherine 100%, but I would just add to throw your little regional or your local flair on that, you know, ask those same questions, but what, and also like, yeah, what does it mean to you? Do you not want to donate to food? I don't know, but, um, but all taking in all those questions Catherine asked. Sorry, I was thinking. <laughs> Um, can you repeat the question for me? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so the question was, I mean, I kind of posed was, you know, when people are asking us, you know, what, what, what can I do at this time of year? Um, specifically, where do I put my money, my time? And I think Aaron was asking, Aaron added on to that question, just this, you know, how can we also push organizations uh, who are, you know, critically thinking about this to kind of move to the next level? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't mind us getting, I don't mind the money coming to our thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely your best with organization doing work on the ground. For example, like if I use Janet Finch as an example, like if you're going to be donating to an organization, donate to the organization within the neighborhood or really aiming to build up the neighborhood, you know, or be able to build system and structures and, and implement more changes in the neighborhood. So that's one way I can see from as a resident who lives here, even if I just planted myself on the farm, I would definitely want to donate towards the farm because I know the work that's happening there. And there are lots of other community organizations in the neighborhood as well that's doing that work and be able to support residents in different ways, whether it's food or gift cards and many different other aspects of the chance here and on education and so forth. So there are lots of systems in place in the neighborhood. It's just we need that funding support to be able to keep those things going. So if you really look at the organizations on the ground doing the work and seeing the support they need, I find that's a good avenue to be able to put the funds in because I know the impact that's coming from that. Yeah. Awesome. And there is just one last question there from Arzina and just asking, you know, in 2021, what are each of your organizations or like what is the work that you are working toward building capacity for in 2021? Um, my answer is really quick for this one. Um, for one, um, I like to ask my director because I know a lot of work is happening behind the scenes with the funding and, and planning. Um, so I like to have a conversation with her to see where we're going. And for two, because with the COVID situation, a lot of it is so surrounding that right now. I don't even, I know 2021 is right there, but I can see the difference in the year since the situation is still so present right now. It's like, we just have, right now our plan is literally revolving around the balancing with the COVID and dealing with this, because what happens in the winter, we go into planning mode for the summer season of growing and programming and a lot of that. So that's what a lot of that happens in the winter. For us, so it's like right now with the COVID, for example, the emergency food program, as I mentioned, we got some additional funding, so that's going to keep going. We are able to sustain that for a longer period of time right now. So it's like, so for the big picture, um, I'll have to definitely have a conversation with my upper head and so I can update you on that session later. Um, but for now, definitely, it's hard to see beyond the COVID while the COVID is still so very present right now. But yeah, we're working through it as it comes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wish I could say that we knew that we were going to just, you know, return to normal operations. I mean, I am very concerned that we're, we're just beginning to see the impacts of, uh, on poverty and uh, therefore we may be mired in, in some emergency response for, for a lot longer. I mean, we're going to, to have to wait and see. Um, you know, it's, uh, I heard on the radio the other day, well, I'll be vaccinated by the end of 2021. Well, that's great, it's, that's still a year away. Um, and so, you know, but we are going to have to, you know, we were, we were trying to start moving back towards more of a focus on 
on the regular, you know, community building program. But if that community building programs and and all the other work that we were doing, but that um, said, uh, I, you know, then we've all gone back into lockdown. So you know, there may be more there may be more emergency funds, either private or public, coming. Uh, those would be continue to be a focus, and then we'll be helping people take their programs online. I guess you know, support people with technology if we can. Um, if, if we continue to be locked down for a while. Um, and then we'll be working on advocacy as well, trying to, to have a voice as, you know, government is focusing on, I mean, there's lots happening at the federal policy level. So, you know, we can do that from our, our living rooms, you know, where we were mostly, uh, our staff anyway, it's mostly still sequestered. So um, policy work will, will continue to be a focus this year. Um. I guess funding um, and I like, of course we're gonna run locally all our programs and all the things that we've been doing all throughout COVID minus like our good food box, but like all our fun stuff. Um, but uh, I guess in the new year, I wear my co-lead hat at, this, at the collaborative where uh, I want to help communities build sustainable uh, food projects in their own communities. And that's what we'll be doing in 2021, hopefully. That's the focus. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for Catherine, Sashoya, and Jessica for sharing some of your thoughts on this issue. Obviously, this, this conversation is not over. Um, I'm just putting in the chat box, for those of you in the Thunder Bay region, um, we are continuing this conversation at the uh, Thunder Bay Area Food Strategy uh, Annual General Meeting on December 17th. And we're gonna have a panel of local speakers here that um, are going to address some of these same questions. And specifically, it's rooted in the, uh, the um, Community uh, Food Security Emergency Food Plan that uh, the Food Strategy um, has, has taken on uh, helping to develop. So for those of you in the region, please uh, join us for that conversation. And to everyone else, thanks so much for your questions and the discussion in the chat box. Um, it this is this has been uh, yeah this is this has been really helpful I think for our our own thinking about this. Um, Aaron, do you want to say anything to finish off? Um, no, I well obviously always something to say, but uh, I feel really privileged to like have this um, span of people here on the panel, and also those of you attending. I know that it's a busy time of year and it's a busy headspace to be in. And I really appreciate the thought and um, yeah, level of conversation. And, you know, like I said, I really think that we're in a place where it's time to re-examine what our um, values and principles and approaches are, especially as, you know, government levels dig, dig deep into just like getting food and food banking. Um, so, yeah, I, I, like, I feel like for Roots, at least, we're in a point of transition and discovery around what this looks like. And I really, you know, look to all of you on this panel as mentors in this. So thank you. And thank you, Charles, for facilitating and just leading a great conversation. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I look forward to being a part of this big community that joined everybody online today. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Be safe. Have a good day.